Nikki, are you ready to learn how to write a great speech? Yes. Okay, how many times have you said, man, I just want to leave here and people remember what I say? Have you ever said that before? Well, today we're going to learn all the things that I learned throughout this past year, all the evaluations that I learned, we're going to cram it down into an hour. You're going to walk out of here with a set of rules and system that you can create a speech that they will remember. You ready? Okay, speech. Right, let's talk about how you can make it a great speech. There's three rules. Make it simple, make it impactful, make it funny. Those are the three things that you need in order to make it a great speech. And let's go over the first one right now, and that's make it simple. The first thing to make it simple is the structure. And too often, people come up to me and say, I have these great stories, I want to share all of them, kind of similar to what you were talking about. I've got these stories, and I want to put them together, and I say, great, let me see it. And the three stories don't match what the message is that they're trying to send. So what you have to do is you have to have an intro and a conclusion, and you have to have your story one, two, and three, three stories, that's it. No more than three, no less. And you have to have them involving the same theme. Now your intro and conclusion need to tie back together. Where was I at the beginning of Trust is a Must? At the wedding. Where was I at the end? At the wedding. What about push past it? Where was I? I was right on the bungee cord. Where was I at the end? The bungee cord. We like that nice little package. Think of it like that. So when you're building a speech, think of your intro and conclusion and how it can tie back and making sure that your story one, two, and three match that theme. Every single one of them had to deal with pushing past something, right? Pushing past my being rejected, being broke, and being off of the swim team that I created. Trust is a must. A time when I lied, a time when I was lied to, and a time when I discovered lying is not the way to go if I want a solid marriage. So when you're creating a structure, keep it simple, have an intro, three stories with the same thing, and a conclusion, a tie back into it. Now this goes back to Scott's original thing that he was talking about this morning, was you have you, a person, a theme, and a constant. That's all that you need in your simple structure. Now you are being taught a lesson by somebody else. You are not teaching the lesson, someone is teaching you. And it's about telling a story of how you learned that. Who is the person that was teaching me and trust is a must? Mom. 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 Constant, right? She was always my mom teaching me about trust, reminding me about it. Now what was my, my theme? Trust. Trust is a must. That was my theme. I didn't steer off of it. I didn't talk about lies. I didn't talk about white lies or confusion. I strictly talked about trust, and I kept it simple. Now, does anyone know the constant object that was in trust is a must? It's when I tell you, you're going to go, ugh, oh, bunny, bunny slippers. Each story had a bunny slipper in it. And that was the constant that tied and had that relation and carried it all the way through those three stories. So what's that object? Now, in, in trust is a must, it was a thing. Does anybody know what it was and push past it? It was shame. Shame was in all three of my stories. From being reminded that I was kicked off the team, from being kicked off the team, from I can't wait to probably I didn't walk home as fast as him. So shame was my constant object. So whether it's a, a person or a place or a thing, making sure you have a constant object in all three of your stories with a theme that isn't Trust or lies, or no, it is strictly one thing, and the person is teaching that to you. I just put out a video on my YouTube channel called Can I Taste Your Speech? And what is the senses, what are the two senses that link back to memory the most? Smell. Smell and taste. taste, right? How often, though, are you tasting and smelling someone's speech? What did you taste and smell in my trust is a must speech? Taste anything? Or smell anything? Cigarette. Cigarette butts. How about some Cheetos. Cheetos you taste some Cheetos? Cheetos? Yeah. yeah. Cigarette butts. There's a, maybe some beer in the red solo cup. Warm beer. 
it's important that you are able to express something in your words of what you can taste and smell. What you can do, what I did, is I printed out my speech, I took five highlighters, I assigned a highlighter per sense, so green was sight, blue was hearing, red was taste, and then any time I tasted something, I highlighted it in my speech. Anything I could see, I highlighted in my speech. And what I realized is, wow, okay, so I'm giving them a lot of vivid imagery. I have a lot of green on my paper, but I don't have a lot of red. I don't have a lot of taste or smell. So you visually can see, wow, all right, I need to add some visual language here that can bring my audience to smell what I'm talking about or taste what I'm talking about. A lot of it was built on, too, I had a lot of vivid language up at front, and I didn't spread it throughout. So those highlighters kind of really show you what you want to do with your five senses. This is my personal opinion, and I will stick with it. I don't believe you should have a prop. And the reason why is you should not have a prop is because if I say the word basketball, can you see a basketball? Right? But you might see a Nike basketball, and you might see a uh, worn out basketball that used to play out when you were a kid. Very different basketballs than they are now. I don't want to trample on your creativity or your imagination. My job is to bring your imagination to life. And when I bring a prop, I force you to see something rather than help you realize whatever it is that you want to think about. If I say milkshake, I'm drinking a milkshake. You might see it in a glass cup. You might see it a vanilla milkshake with whipped cream on top and a cherry. I'm letting you decide what to see. And that's so critical in speaking is you're there for your audience. Let them develop their imagination. This was the hardest for me to learn throughout my process. Because we typically write in the passive voice versus active. But when you're giving a speech, you don't want to tell a story. You want them to be a part of the story and have them go along with you like it's actually happening. Because passive isn't interactive. Passive is, great, that happened. Active is, wow, I'm right there with you and picking up cigarette butts with stupid sheriff's now in grass, right? So what it is, is... Is that really his name? No. <laughs> no, but that really did happen. And, it was not fun at all. At, and long story is, the mayor pardoned us, because it was a small town, and he came up and pardoned us, and it was a, uh, <laughs> um, another, you want to know another funny story? Oh, and this is another prime example. What color were the bunny slippers in? Pink. Were they? No. Uh, no. I never said Never said color. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right. And a pair of bunny slippers. Yeah. And going back to Bill's advice, one person was, you should have a pair of bunny slippers on the, on the stage so they can see what kind of bunny slippers they were. And I was, I didn't listen to that evaluation because I wanted to make sure that I didn't put in a description that let your mind create that yourself. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. So think about that too. What? Right, right. Most people say pink, but some people are like green, yellow, and then everyone's like, what? No, he didn't say anything. So think about that. You don't have to be so descriptive. My speech is simple. It's not really any crazy language. It's just a real story that came from the heart that I wrote in active voice. So Chelsea wrote the essay on cookies. Chelsea's my wife. She loves cookies, and she probably wrote an essay on cookies. <laughs> Rather than the essay on cookies was written by Chelsea. What you do is you do the doer of action and the receiver versus the doer of action, action, and receiver. Okay? Um, what I do is I write my speeches in poem form. And what that means is anytime I take a breath or a pause or end a sentence, I press enter on my screen. So my lines on my paper go down like this, so it looks like a poem. And the reason I do that is because there's two ways that we deliver a speech. One is we deliver a speech that we read. And one is we deliver a speech where it sounds like we're speaking. Which one do we want? Speaking. The one that we're speaking. And when you read it in a paragraph form, it's going to sound like you're reading it. And going back to his saying, uh, I wrote down, practice how you play, because how you play 
sorry, practice how you play, because how you practice is how you will play. So think about that. If you're practicing reading all the time, and then you go up and give a speech, it's going to come off as reading. It's going to come off as unnatural. And that's not what we want. What we want is for you to come across as you're telling a story that's natural and an active voice. So keep it simple. Let's just recap that. You don't want to use a prop. You want to make sure you have an intro, three stories, and a conclusion. The intro and conclusion tie back to each other with the same theme. There is one person who is teaching you something, and there's that constant object that ties in through all three of those stories. You're going to write an active voice, OK? All right, make it impactful. This is the thing that was the hardest for me because I am only 25 years old, so I haven't really gone through a lot of things that are traumatizing, per se, or I haven't really been able to identify who I am. So what this experience did as being the world champion, is it, going for it, is to really help me push out who I am, what is important to me, what kind of impact do I want to lead. And that's what we're going to talk about in this section, which really has changed my life, and a lot of it comes from Randy Harvey. I had just won districts. I'm really excited. And Chelsea and I go to the Grand Canyon. We are sitting there, and I, have, I know I only have 90 days to create a speech that will hopefully be the best speech the world's ever heard in this year. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you know? And I kind of just think to myself, how am I going to do that? What am I going to talk about? What is it that's going to be so powerful that I can leave a message and regardless of what happens, I know I felt good about it. And I'm complaining and I'm down on myself. And Chelsea says, babe, pauses, what would you cross the Grand Canyon for if I was on the other side to tell me? I thought about that for a while and I really resonated on it. And there's somebody in your life that you love, that you respect, whether it's a teacher or a mother or someone who's passed away. And imagine having to take the task of going across this Grand Canyon to tell somebody something that they are going to pass on. What is it going to be? Is it going to be love? Is it going to be don't give up? Is it going to be about it's important to make your kids laugh? What is it that you are going to tell that person and really resonate on it? It's important to be okay with not knowing right now. What's not okay is don't put that question off. Put that at the forefront of your mind and think about it this next week. Especially if you're going to be competing this year and even next. What is it that you would cross the Grand Canyon for and who would that person be on the other side? And once I resonated with it a little bit. It took a couple weeks, and I realized trust is really important to me. That's how Chelsea and I started our relationship. That's a, that's a real story. So Chelsea and I met at this random party. Uh, we, I'm, I'm talking to this one girl at a party, and she goes, you don't know my name, do you? I say, of course I know your name. And Chelsea is behind the girl. And she goes, I'm like, your name is Amy. The girl's like, my name is Jessica. <laughs> and the girl walks away, and Chelsea starts laughing, and I'm like, hey, that's not really cool. She goes, well, I got you to talk to me, and I was like, okay, all right, let's make it. <laughs> so we start laughing for like six hours, no alcohol at the party, we're just having a good time. I'm like, I can't get in a relationship, I'm leaving for seven months in a couple weeks, there's just no way. So the next day, I'm at a park, and Chelsea is at the park too. Kind of like, well, this girl is pretty cool. I'm gonna get her number and say, just she went out. So we go out on a date, and I'm like, look, I'm leaving for seven months. I, if I think you're a really cool girl, I'm not looking for a girlfriend. I'm looking for a wife. If that is something you're interested in, I promise I will be faithful to you. What do you say? She kind of swallowed her fajitas, <laughs> and she reached over the table and she said, deal. And she shook her hand out. And that's, that's how Chelsea and I's relationship got started. So again, what, is those, what are those stories there that really happen to you that you can share and that you can express? I still get excited about thinking that I met Chelsea at a party, at a college party with no alcohol. And that she did that sneaky little trick on me. <laughs> this, I wish I would have learned when I was going through training, but I didn't. This just revolutionized my life 
uh, tremendously. It's called Simon Sinek's Golden Circle, and he's probably going to sue me for using this, because I, <laughs> but at least I'm giving him credit that it's his. 99% of the world focus on what, how, and why. So they say, what do I want to do, how am I going to do it, and why is it important, right? What do I want to do? I want to get a good job. How am I going to do it? I'm going to work hard. Why? Because I need money. Even though money isn't really a why, that's just a pr product of what you would get. But why is I need to feed my family or I need to do something else, right? 1% of the world, not the bad 1%, but the 1% like the Steve Jobs and the Wright brothers and the Martin Luther King, they do something differently. And Simon Sinek discovered it. And they focus on why they want to do it, how it's going to be done, and what it's going to produce. This seriously revolutionized my life. How often do you go into, what do I want to do? All right, this is how I'm going to do it. Why? Now imagine starting off with something. Why is it that I want to compete in the world championship? How am I going to do that? And what is it going to get me? Why do I want to compete? I want to push myself to no limit. I want to prove to myself that I can throw everything I have into something and do it. How am I going to do it? I am going to put all of my energy into something, make sure that I exhaust every resource that I have, and what's it going to produce? It's going to tell me and produce who I am. That's powerful, right? So focus on the why, then the how, then the what. Now with Randy Harvey, he asked, when I came into his office, and he told me, I will coach you if you give a speech from the heart. I promised him I would. I said, Randy, I'll be honest with you, how do you know if you're giving a speech from the heart? There's a lot of things I want to talk about. And he gave me three questions that I had to answer, because we met every week. And his three questions were, who am I, what am I about, and where did I learn it? Who am I? What am I about? And where did I learn it? So who am I? I am a son. I'm a brother. I am a college graduate. I am broke. <laughs> I am all of these things. And what I did is I took three pieces of paper, I laid them out on the table, and I wrote the first question at the top. I said, who am I? And I wrote everything down on paper, not on a computer. It's important to do it on a piece of paper. And the reason why is, is because too often we get uh, cynical or get critical of ourselves and it's very easy to delete something. Where when you write it down, you're not going to most likely write it or erase it or scratch it out. So write it down on a piece of paper. Then the second thing, what am I about? Well, I'm about adventure and love and happiness and giving and trust. And I wrote all of those words down. And then where did I learn? I learned it from my third grade teacher, I learned it from my grandmother, I learned it from my mom, I learned it from the guy that's sitting next to me on the bus. And I thought about all these things that I learned it. And then you look at these three pieces of paper, and something kind of hits you and you kind of resonate. And there's this connection there that you see and you say, oh, there's a speech there that I really want the world to hear about. I want to talk about trust, and I want to tell people that I learned it from my mom, because that is important to me. Take three pieces of paper, write it down, and again, it's so important because people will come up to me and they'll say, Brian, man, you just whipped that speech right out. That's awesome. And I say, I did not whip that speech out. I worked 5 a.m. to midnight every day on creating this speech. If you would have stretched it out, it would have been over a year for sure on the speech. So it's important to give yourself a little break <laughs> on, hey, look, it's okay that I'm not finding the answer to this. People say, well, what was one thing that you wish you would have changed throughout your training? And I said, I wish I would have been a little less harsh on myself. Because there would be times when I was just like, God, I need to figure this out, I need to figure this out, I need to figure this out. Well, you, you don't. You need to just ask yourself, what is it, who I am, where did I learn it, and what, I'm, what is it my bad? And then it goes down to, this is uh, the whiteboard that I talked about that I had in my house that Chelsea does not like, because <laughs> it's in the middle of our living room. But what I did is, see, I wrote 2012 World Champion of Public Speaking, and then I wrote, oh, thank you, that's so much better. And this thing is, it's kind of, uh, it's pretty life-size. I mean, this is how big it is, but it goes all the way to the floor, to the top. It 
goes kind of out there. And this is how I wrote the speech. Because it's important to visualize so you can crystallize what you want to accomplish, right? So every morning, I'd wake up at 5 a.m., I'd look at this screen, and I'd ask myself, what does the world need to hear in 2012? And I'd see, I am the world champion of public speaking. I'd look at what makes a good speech. I'd talk about the things that people gave me evaluations on. And that's how I'd start out my morning with 15 minutes of, OK, I'm visualizing this. I'm seeing it. I've got it down on paper. Now let's move into practice, and let's move into rewriting the speech. So what time of day do you have that you can set aside? I'm a morning person. I wake up at 5 a.m. That's my alone time. Maybe yours is at night. Maybe yours is in the afternoon. But you have to have time to be able to really find that impact that you want to make, where your cell phone isn't by you, your email isn't ding, because those little distractions are going to interfere with the momentum that you're building up to try to find that impact. So I, I wake up at 5, my cell phone isn't on, my computer isn't on, I sit, I take five minutes of alone time, I read five pages of it, something, whether it's uh, right now I'm reading Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and then I go into, okay, the work that I need to, to do that day. And then I turn on my email and my phone and check all the social media. You have to take that time to really find that impact in your life. Title equals impact. It goes back to my belief in the title is impactful. Don't give a, a, a title that, uh, Scott's going to disagree with me on, that keeps them guessing. You want, for me, you want people to know what you're going to talk about. You don't want, you don't want necessarily too many surprises. You, you want them to say, okay, the speech is going to be about trust. Let me hear what he has to say about trust. And I didn't teach you about trust. I reminded you about trust, and that's important too. Right? I wasn't saying, look, you need to tell the truth. This is my finger. I just reminded you of a story where I lied. I showed you my vulnerability. How many people have lied to their mom before? Right? <laughs> Yeah, so I connected with you because I was able to be vulnerable and I said, look, I've lied to my mom, I have been lied to, and I still wish I could find that guy because I want to tell him. Actually, I don't want to tell him because then he'd be like, hey, you used me in your speech. But <laughs> <laughs> title equals impact, okay? So let's recap impact. Who would you cross the Grand Canyon for? And what would you want to tell them so they pass it on? You have one more trip left in your life. Your backpack's on crossing this thing, you have to get there because you have to tell them this message. Who is it? What do you tell them? Another part of your impact is Simon Sinek Circle. Don't start with the what, start with the why. Why am I doing this? How is it going to be done? And what result is it going to produce? Ask yourself Randy Harvey's three questions. Who am I? What am I about? And where did I learn it? Make sure your title is impactful and that you visualize to crystallize what you want to get out of life. And whether that's a whiteboard or pieces of paper or note cards, take five minutes of alone time every day. Craig Valentine said it too. I, I really liked his speech. It resonated with me because I had done five minutes of alone time before he gave that speech. But it's, it's true. If you want to make an impact, you have to think about it. You can't just wish it. I, I, I'm stuck on Les Brown right now. Uh, and I'm reading a lot of his stuff and watching a lot of his stuff. And he says, you don't get what you want because you want it. You get what you want because it's who you are. So who are you? What kind of impact are you making? And then the last one is make it funny, which we obviously have some fantastic talent in the back, and they can probably school me on this subject. <laughs> this is my biggest weakness is make it funny. But I had to really, really work on it, and I'm telling you, if I could have 17 laughs in a seven minute speech, because I did the same thing where I evaluated how many laughs do I have, how many seconds is it, and I evaluated all the other speakers, right? So Lance Miller had 19, Randy Harvey had over 20. Um, all these people had the different amounts of laughter, so I kind of calculated it was. For me, I actually had a low amount of laughter. 17 is low in a world championship speech. You should around kind of have 20 laugh lines. And they don't have to be the, they can be the, what do you call them? The, they're not Twitter, but. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter. Is that right? I just feel like I'm saying a bad word. <laughs> you can have a couple titters in there, but 
<laughs> um, <laughs> so we'll talk about make it funny. Okay, going back to make it funny and how can you think about things that are funny? Well, it goes back to times when you fail. Times that you fail. So maybe you fail because you got a bad spray tan. <laughs> this is a spray tan of this open house that I think is absolutely hysterical. Or maybe it's a time when you're a pet owner and you really kind of made a mistake on <laughs> feeding your pet. Or maybe it is a time when you're on a game show in front of millions of people and you answer the wrong question. It says, which of the following is the largest, the moon or an elephant? <laughs> Talk about those times when you failed and express to people, hey, I have failed, this is when I messed up. And how you can know if it's funny is, I call it the three humor tests, especially in an international competition. You have to, A, be able to say, can I say this in front of my grandma? Will it be offensive if I say it in front of my grandma? Now, I have a pretty liberal grandma, so maybe you should think of another grandma. <laughs> Can you say it in front of a grandmother that at the Thanksgiving table? Think of it that way. So that's the first question. Second question is, can you say it in front of a 7 and 70 year old and they'll both understand it? They'll both laugh. 7 and 70 year old. And then the third test, or the gamut is, can you say it from a person, can you say it in front of a people from three different countries? Whatever countries you want to choose, whether it's China, Ireland, and United States. Because there is often a lot of humor that's in our country that the other world might not necessarily understand. And you have to be able to give laughter where you can answer no to, or yes to all three of those questions. Okay, yes, I can give it to those three people. Yes, I can give it to a 70 year old. Yes, I can give it to my liberal grandma. <laughs> okay, you have to be able to, to say that. And once you do that, you kind of are on the, the right track of getting the right humor. Because how many people have moms? We all have moms. How many people have lied to a mother? We all. How many people have actually lied or been lied to? Those are all stories that can say yes to all three of those questions. And times when you fail, this is, or things failed you. <laughs> I'm in uh, Victoria, and I couldn't go in because I'm 6'4", and this is 6'3". <laughs> so just some fun times that you kind of, stories that you can think about. Uh, well, all my friends went on this field trip, and I couldn't go into this building because I was too tall. <laughs> like, that's not fun. Or the best, it's from your family. The best humor that you can get is family humor. This is my wonderful family. This is Chelsea. This is my sister, my new brother-in-law, my mom with the bunny slippers. When I won, my mom was there. And the first thing she says up <laughs> when I get done and things come down, she goes, we have to go to the outlet mall. I'm like, mom, I am not going to the outlet mall. Why are we going to the outlet mall? She's like, because we have to get bunny slippers, and that's how I'm walking into the presidential ball with. Because <laughs> after the competition, there's the presidential dance and ball, and she really wanted to walk in with money slippers, so we shopped for like three hours afterwards, and we couldn't find them, thank goodness. <laughs> this is my grandmother. This is Annie J and then my aunt. And so those same people are these same people who are wild and crazy and have funny stories, and my mom is insane. And they, these three women alone could give me like 18 speeches. This is my mom and my sister and Chelsea. They're crazy and wild, and they've got stories that I can share about for hours and hours and hours. So in your family, I should probably change this photo because Chelsea doesn't know that I have another. <laughs> <laughs> so think about your family. Everyone's got that weird uncle. Everyone's got that crazy mom story. Think about those times that kind of you laugh at when you're sitting at the Thanksgiving dinner table, right? Think about those things. This slide is important because if I could drill home anything, it would be practice, 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 practice. I'm going to say it one more time, practice. Why? Because when I practice and when I gave different speeches, I would give speeches where people, the same speech, where someone would laugh, some, one group would laugh, one group wouldn't. Even in this situation today, right? My speech has 17 laughs. Push past it has 19. We kind of 
maybe chuckled a little bit in here, right? It was different energy, which is totally fine, but you have to be able to understand that. That just because no one's laughing in this environment doesn't mean that it's not funny. It means there's something else happening, whether it's the lights are dim, or we've been in a conference for eight hours, or the people are too afraid to laugh and show that it's funny. There are a variety of different things. And when you practice and you get evaluations, you understand, okay, maybe that was a little funny. The, the head tilt in my push past it line when I say, is it really necessary to write three more paragraphs after that sentence? That head tilt is what got, that was my biggest laugh in push past it. Actually, push past it, trust as much. It was seven seconds in the district level, which is pretty large. That one, that one laugh. So I got that evaluation because I practiced. If I wouldn't have practiced, and this was maybe my 70th time I gave push past it until I finally got the, hey Ryan, if you tilt your head when you say that, it'll drive it home. So when you practice, you're going to get more feedback and you're going to do a better job of proving that you're funny and proving that you can do things differently. So practice, practice, practice. Say it with me. Practice. Okay, good. We all know to practice. This is the rule that I use for humor, and it's the big, big, small, or small, small, big, okay? So for example, let's say I'm giving a speech on uh, teens going bad in the United States, right? So it's, uh, or yeah, teens not understanding American values. So I say <coughs> we're facing high pregnancy, in teens, we are facing uh, high drug usage in teens, and we are facing teenagers cutting their hair like Justin Bieber. Right? Two serious things and a small thing that isn't really equivalent to the things that I just said, but I released it with that tension of something that was really small and insignificant. So big, big, or you could do the small, small, big scenario. We say two little things and throw it with a big thing. That is how you can improve to make it a better speech. I'm going to turn the light on. So you make it simple, you make it impactful, and you make it funny. Three things that you can do to really drive home an amazing speech that they'll remember. Did you take plenty of notes? Are you going to walk out of here knowing now how to develop and write a better speech? Yeah? Who's going to be the next world champion in public speaking? Anyone? Oh, yeah, we got a couple in the room. All right, all right. Okay, do you have any questions? I've got about five minutes, and I'll be happy to answer anything else that I can for you today. I've had so much fun. Yes? It's something that I know about, but could you share with everybody about infamemes? Infamemes? I don't know about infamemes. Okay, that was actually it's what you're talking about, about not making it specific, so you create a word picture. Oh, okay. I mean, Randy's real big on that. Yeah, He yeah, may yeah. not have used that word with you. But. No, he did. He did. I, I sorry. <laughs> Don't tell Randy. I, I did not know what infamy means. I remember <laughs> writing that down. Uh, yeah, so it's, when Randy gave his anthememes speech, or anthememes, one of his things was uh, flannel shirt. And he just said flannel shirt, and he said, everyone raised their hand and said, oh yeah, it's a red flannel shirt. But it's not really red, it's just a flannel shirt. And there are times when you don't want to be too descriptive. Again, it goes back to simplicity. Keep it simple. Let the audience's imagination run wild because you are talking in an active voice. So literally, they are running with you during the story. And they are experiencing it with you. I, I did another thing when, when I competed. It's called blocking, where you put everything on stage. I want you to go back. And tonight, I want you to watch Trust is a Must again on my YouTube channel. And I want you to see how every time Chelsea is right there, my mom is standing right here. I have a computer screen right here. I blocked it where they are always on the stage in the exact same spot. So I'm always at the altar, and Chelsea is standing right here. I go back to my mom every time right there. I go back to the computer screen. College is back here. So blocking and keeping it simple is really important too. Anything else? Y'all are awesome. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed being here.